folks over here primarily to, to talk about Alive She Cried, which Alive is cried. an album of um, recordings that uh, disappeared mysteriously and have found their way back into your hands. Um, sort of like the Raiders of the Lost Ark at the, uh, the last scene in the movie when the Ark is put in this box and uh, filed away somewhere in the back and it's just put in and, and it looks like every other box. Well, I think that happened to the Doors records, or the Doors tapes, except the tapes were mislabeled. Somebody had the wrong label or it didn't have a label on it and uh, the tapes just disappeared. Uh, we knew they were somewhere in some storage facility in Los Angeles, but it was impossible to find them, and we assumed that they had been just lost or something, but then we said, wait a minute, they can't be lost. There must be, like, who knows how many boxes of tapes there are. You can't lose, you can, I can understand losing one or two boxes, but this is impossible. So uh, through a lengthy search, um, the hiring of a private investigator uh, to... Uh, Missing persons, well, find a missing tapes. Um, he couldn't find them either. And uh, fortunately, Ben Edmonds, uh, who um, is our manager, quote unquote manager at the moment, um, was able to locate the tapes in a uh, storage facility. And it was like, Eureka, here they are. God, it's, it's great. And uh, Paul Rothschild proceeded to uh, sit down and listen to all the tapes, popping cans as he went. And um, he called out uh, what he considered to be, uh, you know, some of the best material. And uh, then uh, the John and Robbie and I got together. I'm Ray Mancerik of The Doors. And the three of us got together and uh, listened to, uh, you know, pro approximately who knows how many hours, three, four hours worth of material. And out of it, we picked the best stuff to make Alive She Cried. Robbie, which uh, period of The Doors' career musical career did the recordings come from? Well, most of it was done uh, from 68 through 69, probably. And uh, most of it was done on this one tour where we we decided to record live and we brought our own uh, equipment, you know, eight-track tape recorders with us. And uh, it was in New York, Philadelphia, um, Detroit, and I think Boston. And a couple of the cuts come from a uh, European television show, which we did, uh, I think, in 69. It's quite interesting, although 69 or the, the late 60s aren't that far away, recording techniques weren't as sophisticated as they are in the 80s. And what surprises me listening to the album is, is the quality of the recording. Now, did you have to do anything magical to remix it, to bring it up to the standards today, or was it pretty much as you left it in the can? Well, Paul Rothschild, a uh, wonderful producer, and uh, Bruce Botnick was the original engineer on the project, so um, when we first recorded these things, and they did a fine job of getting it on the tape. But we did uh, use uh, all the techniques in the recording studio, State of the Arts Fidelity. Uh, the board is so much better today. Uh, the electronics are so much better, and uh, we had everything separated, fortunately. Organ was on one track, drums were on other tracks, Robbie had his track free. So Paul was able to do everything that you could possibly do to that guitar track. All right, let's take that guitar track and make it sound as good as we can possibly make it sound today. And we had a nice degree of separation. It had some leakage, of course, since it was a live situation. So on the organ track, you could hear the drums and a little bit of guitar and Jim's voice. So all of that had to be balanced and uh, really had to be worked with properly. And uh, Rothschild uh, takes full responsibility for making it sound as good as it does. He's, a, he's an excellent, excellent producer. Robbie, the, the album is actually the only live album that The Doors ever released. I think all the rest of them were studio recordings, weren't they? Well, no, we had a, an album called Absolutely Live, and uh, that was from the same batch of recordings as this one comes from. But uh, uh, during that time, we, uh, we, uh, we picked different songs than we would have today, mainly because, like, for instance, with Light My Fire, uh, that wasn't on, a live sh on the uh, first live album. At that time, you know, Light My Fire was our big popular song, and we've, we wanted people to hear some other more obscure songs, you know. So luckily, we didn't use it then. We were able to use it now. Light My Fire really became a, a rock anthem during its time. Indeed, I guess The Doors and, and Light My Fire synonymous as being 
probably what epitomised the whole idea of West Coast rock groups. In fact, I think probably the Doors were more influential in that department than any, any other band. Well, uh, perhaps over here, you know, certainly uh, uh, east, of, uh, east of the Mississippi River in America, you know, we were very big in New York, too, and the whole East Coast, and then uh, coming, extending back over into Europe. Um, but in California, there were lots of, uh, you know, San Francisco sound and the Los Angeles sound, uh, Love and the Birds and uh, bands like that, and all the bands up in San Francisco, the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and Country Joe and the Fish. There were, between L.A. and San Francisco, there were just hundreds of great bands, and, uh, you know, we just happened to be one of them. When Jim Morrison died in Paris in, in the early 70s, was that the end of the Doors as, as a band, or did you carry on performing and, and keep the name together and, and, and uh, write and record music? Uh, we made two albums after Jim left the planet. One was called Other Voices, and the other was called Full Circle. And uh, John, Ray, and Robbie uh, did those two albums. But uh, after that, uh, the Doors were put to bed. How did you feel about that? Because uh, About Jim, uh, because... In many ways, uh, people that wrote about The Doors or, or listened to their music or were critics of you always seemed to bring Jim into the, the front line, as it were, and left the rest of you, the three remaining members of The Doors, to just get on with it. How did you feel about that? Just, if you like, uh, being the support band for a, a solo singer. Robbie? Well, we, we, and in reality, we were not just a support band for a solo singer, and we knew that. And you know we were all equally important in the in the band, but uh, as far as the press was concerned, uh, and uh, I guess the public too, they you know the, all they wanted to know about was uh, Morrison because he was the front man, he was the crazy guy, and they all wanted to know about him. And actually, that was fine with me because uh, I was content to sit in the background and and you know Morrison caught a lot of flack from being the guy up in front which uh, we were shielded from. So it really didn't bother me too much. So what happened to your own career when you finished doing the Two Doors albums after Jim's death in, what, 71, I believe? Uh, well, let's see, that was 72, I guess. Well, it went rapidly downhill. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, well, what happened was, uh, after the Doors broke up, we, we decided to come here to England and... Uh, possibly find another singer or whatever but we soon realized that that was a foolish idea and uh, ended up where John and, and myself uh, formed a new group called the Butts Band and uh, with some English people namely uh, Jess Roden and uh, Philip Chen and a guy named Roy Davis and uh, we went along and that you know Doing, I, I went along doing other solo projects, and I've been in music for you know since then. Going back to Jim for a second again, um, he was considered um, very talented as a singer, but also as a writer. And uh, in fact, in the last months of his life, he was in Paris. Uh, we are told writing uh, poetry and prose. Um, various other literary things. Do you think if he'd lived he would have uh, become a great writer, become a modern contemporary writer, and say like a Hemingway or Steinbeck? Um, I doubt if he would have been that kind of a writer, but uh, you know it's hard to say what he would have done, but his writings were more more uh, on the order of a Rambo or a, you know some of your uh, more greater poets and uh, not really in the novel. He wouldn't be in the novel field, I don't think. Although, you never know, but uh, I think he was capable of writing anything. But I think he would have probably gotten into the films aspect of things and would have been probably a director. Ray, Robbie mentioned that uh, you came over here after uh, Jim died and, and tried to, to form a group. Now, Britain, and London in particular, is a place that The Doors played when Jim was alive. You played a concert here, I think, at uh, either the Utho UFO Club or the Middle Earth. I can't remember now, but it was, it was filmed by British television, mm -hmm. so there was a, quite a lot of interest in this mm -hmm. country around The Doors, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it was at, a, at the Roundhouse. I, I, uh, I don't know exactly uh, what... Uh, 
what they called it at the time, but uh, it was called The Doors Are Open, and uh, wonderful, wonderful show, and a great audience over here. That, was, uh, that show was incredible. It was psychedelic West Coast California comes to uh, London. It was The Doors and the Jefferson Airplane. I'd love to have seen that show back in 68. God, that was a, it was a great time, a fabulous audience. And when he, after the last set, the last night, we walked out of the place and the sun was coming up. It was uh, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and it was sunrise and sunrise in London after playing two incredible nights. And it was one of the, certainly one of the high points of my career. Much has been written about The Doors. In fact, there's now currently a, an illustrated history written by Danny Sugarman, which comes out almost simultaneous to the release of Alive, She Cried, the live album. Will you be glad um, somewhere down the line to eventually put to bed The, the Doors as a group and, and stop talking about the band and continue doing something else? Um, only, only when Morrison's words are known by the public. At that point we will have done our job and when Doors music is known and what Jim was actually saying when you can get beyond the leather pants and get beyond the image of Jim Morrison to understand the mind of Jim Morrison at that point I'll be satisfied and that's why we're here now is because Jim said listen to the words man just listen to the words don't pay attention to what I do don't pay attention to anything else just listen to my lyrics and if you get Jim Morrison's lyrics and really begin to understand his words at that point I have nothing more to say but until that time I'm going to tell you what he's talking about well aside from um, talking about Jim Morrison's words and what he was trying to say musically and 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 lyrically you've also been working on an opera Carl Orff I believe Carmina Burana. Burana. Carmina Burana, yes. Carl Orff, um, 1937 composition, um, modern, uh, sort of contemporary uh, Germanic music, and uh, cantata for uh, full symphonic orchestra and a huge chorus. And what we've done, uh, Philip Glass, uh, an American uh, avant garde composer, uh, is the producer. And what we did is uh, reduce it to a. Uh, in essence, uh, I suppose you could call it rock band uh, synthesizers and chorus. Um, we have a basic rock band playing jazz rock band, playing the pulsing foundation. Uh, the orchestral parts are all done by uh, synthesizers, electronically generated sounds, and over the top of that we put uh, a full chorus. And uh, it's a wonderful album, and I'm very, very happy with it, and had a grand time recording it. And uh, I hope Carl Orff, uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He, he left the planet also and went up to composer's heaven uh, about two years ago. But uh, I hope his spirit is happy. What inspired you to uh, record it? Well, the, uh, perhaps the ribald, bacchanalian, Dionysian sense of the music. It's... Uh, it's Curiously, like uh, Doors music or like Ray Manzarek piano style, and uh, certainly the lyrics are very Morrison esque. Uh, renegade monks from the 12th, 13th century uh, celebrating the joys of uh, sex, drinking, uh, the fecundity of, of the earth, springtime. It's Morrison esque sort of things. It's about uh, revelry, about uh, just enjoying life and celebrating the how good it is to be alive and all the wonderful things of life and not being a closed off in a little monastery. Same thing Morrison was talking about. Morrison was talking about getting out there and being your own man on the planet, your own human being, and dancing madly on a hillside in front of a bonfire and just celebrating life and really getting into it. And that's what Karl Orff did with the music. I think he was inspired by the monk's words uh, the same way the doors were inspired by Morrison's words. And the music uh, has a great similarity to it. And I, I just said, this, I'm going to do this. Uh, this is something, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, a piece of music I've always loved. And... Uh, the time came when I was able to realize a dream I've had for a long time.